Hello again. In this episode, we're going to address the question, is life insurance a good investment? Oh, I wish I had a nickel for every time I've been asked that question in my 45 year career. The short answer is absolutely not because it's not an investment. The financial services industry says an investment means your money is subject to volatility in the market and it's going to be taxable. I don't want to pay taxes on where I put my money and I don't want volatility. So is it a superior place to put your serious cash? Absolutely. Are you confused? I'm going to clear up that confusion right now. I'm Doug Andrew and uh, I've helped people optimize their financial assets and minimize taxes for 45 years. And you know what? When I say no, life insurance uh, should not be purchased as an investment because if you understand the definition of investment based upon the financial services industry and all the regulators, I don't want an investment because they say investments are usually subject to market volatility and they are going to be taxable sooner or later as in an IRA or 401k. I don't want to pay taxes on what I'm earning, where I put my money, and I don't want to be subject to market volatility. So life insurance, uh, is it a good investment? It's not even deemed an investment in the Internal Revenue Code. It has a totally different section that allows you to accumulate access and transfer your money totally income tax free. Now, it's funny in this day and age where uh, people say, oh, um, your house is a good investment. Do you know that uh, a financial planner cannot call your house an investment legally? We say, oh, I invested in my kid's college education. No, you can't call that an investment. So this is why people get confused. That's why I let all my licenses go back in 2005, because I'm fine. Uh, but it's because I needed to help educate you, people all over America, on the best way to save. The financial services industry does not allow me, if I have a license, to teach you in the vernacular to help you understand. So do I think life insurance is an excellent place to accumulate money? Absolutely. Is it a good investment? Not under the definition of investment. It actually is way better than that. You know, I, in other uh, episodes, talk about the history behind my favorite uh, vehicle, indexed universal life insurance. And with, when E.F. Hutton came out with his idea back in 1980, I used to use the metaphor of a bucket. I would help people establish an insurance contract and some of my clients ended up with four, five, six, seven. I had one person had 17 of these because once you fill up one, there's no limit to what it grows to, but you don't want to mess around with a grandfathered bucket that is tax free. This would be an insurance policy. And so if they had more money, new money, and they would open another one and another one and another one to diversify because why would you diversify into inferior vehicles when this is superior to anything else. And you can learn why in my various books and educational videos. But uh, when I have a client that has a, an insurance contract, Universal Life, it's like a bucket. What happened is uh, the IRS said, well, under three sections of the code, section uh, 72E, money you put into this insurance policy, this bucket, uh, you're putting after tax dollars into it but it will grow tax free. If you want to access income out of it, you can do that and you don't have to pay tax on any of the income. And when you die, it blossoms and transfers tax free. But EF Hutton said, hey, uh, let's take the minimum death benefit. Instead of trying to get the most insurance for the least premium, you're trying to get the least amount of death benefit the IRS will let you get away with and put in the most money as fast as the IRS allows. And uh, these are tax citations, TEF for DEFRA and TAMRA, and they were passed back in 1982, 1984, and 1988. So TEFRA and DEFRA dictates the minimum amount of insurance that you must have attached to the insurance policy in order for it to not move from tax-free uh, umbrella in the Internal Revenue Code over to taxable investments. You cannot change the definition from tax-free insurance to investment because now you've just triggered tax. So that's why you can't call it an investment. And so you do that, but when E.F. Hutton designed this, the IRS allowed us to have parity. Now that means it doesn't matter if you're a 22-year-old athletic marathon running female or a 67-year-old geezer like me 
or an 83-year-old friend of our family who had three blocked arteries, adult onset diabetes, and a prostate cancer episode, and six sisters predeceased him and three brothers. The cost of insurance, which is the spigot on this bucket, is the same for all of us. Because the amount of insurance required when you're structuring it to perform as a living tax-free accumulation benefit and tax-free income, the amount of insurance is less every year older you are and the more unhealthy you are, as long as you can uh, still qualify, the cost of insurance is the same. So in a nutshell, uh, for years, I have earned 9% and netted eight on some of my universal life policies. I've, I've earned 11 and netted 10. That 1% is the cost of the insurance, the spigot on that bucket, that makes it tax-free. But I'm earning 11, I'm netting 10%. That 1% would be otherwise payable tax if I put it in a, a vehicle like an IRA or 401k. So uh, it's really free insurance, not really but I'm not paying for it. But see, an 83-year-old, if he earns 11, he nets 10, just like the 22-year-old, because the amount of insurance required is less the older you are and the more unhealthy you are. You cannot believe how many insurance agents don't even understand what I just said. When you do that, uh, then in 1988, they said, okay, you have to spread out the funding. So let's say you wanted to put $500,000 into this. We have many people who do that. Sometimes when they're 50, 55 years old, sometimes we structure them to accommodate a million or five million. You can't do that in an IRA or 401k. You can only fund it usually in about uh, four years in one day. The first year you can put in 100,000, the next year another 100, the next year another 100, the next year another 100. If this was on the first day of the first year, you put in the first 100,000, in four years and one day into the fifth year, you can finish filling up the bucket. And once you do that, you have now grandfathered yourself to be able to have tax-free growth and tax-free access to all the money in there, all the interest forever after. And that's called grandfathering. So it will knock the socks off of any other vehicle. This spigot, the cost of the insurance, is actually watering a money tree that will blossom when you die because if I put in 500,000 and I die, it leaves behind 1,250,000 at age 60, let's say. Now, I can buy way more life insurance than that with 500,000, but that's not the objective when you're doing this. You're trying to take the least amount of insurance and put in the most money. So as I begin to put in the money, pretty soon 500,000 of the million 250 death benefit is my own money. So that spigot on the bucket is only draining out the difference for 750,000 of insurance because 500,000 is my own money. If this 500,000 doubles in seven to 10 years like mine has done, well, now I have a million, 500,000 doubles to a million, and now the only risk the insurance company has is 250,000, the difference between the original million 250 and the million that's now my own money. Do you know, usually in less than 10 years, you're not having to pay for insurance anymore. You've got a grandfather tax-free bucket because it's all your money now and it's all tax-free. When you die, it just blossoms by about 5%. So what does that mean? Tefra and DEFRA provides Parity. It doesn't matter your age, gender, or health. The amount of insurance required can be squeezed down so that everybody has the same rate of return. Parity means equality. The owner receives the tax free accumulation and in income. I own some of these on my wife. My wife owns them on me. My kids own them on me. I own them on my kids. The owner of the insurance contract is the one that gets all the tax free growth and income. I'm just using surrogates to put the insurance on. This is why banks own insurance policies on people. They don't need the death benefit. They want the tax-free income and growth on the insurance. And so they just simply put the insurance on somebody else and they let them have the difference if they happen to die, but the bank owns the policy on somebody else. The insurance component can become cheaper as you get older. Have you ever seen an insurance policy get cheaper as, it, as you get older? You haven't seen one done like this? Every year older, I have some that I've had for 30 years and they cost 1 20th what they did when I was age 30. If you have not seen one structured to get cheaper as you get older, you have not seen it done correctly. It's the best way to buy term and invest the difference. So let me show you in a glimpse uh, the power behind this. So let me connect the dots for you. When you structure an indexed universal life insurance contract the proper way, 
under Section 72E, 7702, and 101A of the Internal Revenue Code. It's an incredible capital accumulation tool, a place to put money where it grows safely, tax-free, at incredible predictable rates of return. You could structure it to where you can throw in 500 grand, or you could just structure it to put in 500 bucks a month. But the minimum death benefit, let's say if you were 60, might be a million 250,000. If you're older, it might only be 800,000. If you're 20 years old, it might be 5 million. But that insurance costs the same regardless of whether you're young or old under TEFRA and DEFRA. And those are the tax citations that I talked about. The reason why I love this is because it gives me tax deferred growth. It's tax free accumulation and transfer. It gives me a competitive internal rate of return. I've averaged 8.2% net for the last 45 years. It's creditor proof. If you happen to pass away, they can't just come and grab this. It is protected from creditors uh, of a deceased person. It has guarantees in there. I can have a guarantee of I will never lose when the market goes down, or I can have a guaranteed floor of 3% if I want. Unlimited contribution. I'm not restricted like IRAs or 401ks. If I have a banner a year, I can throw in 100 or 200,000. I can skip and coast and not put any money in and then put in a whole lump sum later and make up for the lost time. You can't do that in an IRA or 401k. You have a lot of investment options when it comes to the actual indices or the index that you choose. It can be estate tax free if your advisor knows what they're doing. You have liquidity, you have use, you have control, you have safety of principle, and you can use it as collateral. You can borrow your money out of the policy at 2% and uh, they will continue to credit you 2%. So you can take your money out, there's no charge, or you can borrow at maybe 5% and they'll keep crediting you the index rate of 10%. Many clients do that. Or you can take your policy to a bank and if you have a half a million in there, they'll loan you a half a million because this is rock solid in an institution ranked six notches higher in safety than the bank is. So you can use it as collateral. So the takeaway is you want to structure it under TEFRA, DEFRA, and TAMRA guidelines so your money accumulates tax-free. You can access it tax-free when you die at Blossoms and Transfers tax-free. But this is not an investment. <laughs> In my opinion, it is way better than that. But we always have to say life insurance policies are not investments and accordingly should not be purchased as an investment. So what is it? People say, I've always thought insurance in general was a poor investment. Actually, we agree. Because most of the time, it's not an investment. It's an insurance policy. And unfortunately, most insurance policies are not structured to do what I just explained to you. How unfortunate is that? So what can go wrong if it's not structured properly under tax guidelines, if it's not funded correctly, if it's not designed in accordance with IRS guidelines to be tax-free, if you don't comply with these sections of the code, no, it's not going to be tax-free. It's going to move over to the investment section of the code, which are subject to taxes sooner or later. If you use the wrong product or the wrong company, but even if people understand the product and the company, if their advisor is not proficient, they will waste five, six, seven years before they realize, ah, my nephew, my brother-in-law told me they could help me. Why didn't my money double like Doug Andrew says on the radio? I look at it and in less than 60 seconds, I go, who designed this for you? They had no clue what they were doing. How unfortunate. You want to go to an advisor that's proficient. If you want a checklist of how to know if your advisor knows what they're doing, I would recommend you read this book. There's a checklist in here, but you'll be able to go on a deep dive. And that's why I write books. This is free if you would like a copy. Uh, you just cover a nominal shipping and handling fee, the laser fund. This is over 300 pages of chart graphs, examples, and also 62 actual client stories of how the laser fund is used not only for retirement, but college funding. It knocks the socks off of a 529 plan for college funding for your kids or grandkids. Emergency funds, uh, real estate management, business planning, working capital, and you'll see why this is my favorite vehicle. Go to laserfund.com and get your free copy. I want to fire one out to you so you can be empowered and not miss out on the fortune so many people miss out on because they won't take the time to learn and get educated.